We're live. All right, so welcome to Computer Science E259, Lecture 7. So I, I feel I say this every week, but I really like this stuff. And I really like the latter half of this course because we finally transitioned from things client side to things server side. So now do we escape this sandbox in which we've been playing with, say, uh, Stylus and XML Spy and Zalin at the command line, as well as implementing your own parser, and actually using some of these same building blocks in the context of a web server. So starting tonight, and starting with projects three and four, among the uh, experiences you will have is running your own web server on the nice system, but running a web server slash application server called uh, Apache Tomcat, which is not only popular, but it's also rather high performing. Uh, it's also freely available and will allow us to run these things called servlets and JSPs, which you've presumably heard of since you're here in the first place. But before we forge ahead, let's take a quick look back. The three highlights of last week, if you will, were these three things. So namespaces. Uh, what's the point of XML namespaces? Qualify the XML. So to qualify the XML. Okay, good. Uh, push, push a little harder. What, what does that mean? Uh, to make it unique uh, within a, uh, I kind of want to use the word namespace, but anyway, <laughs> uh, similar to what a package does for okay. uh, so sure, so similar in spirit to this notion of packages in Java, namespaces in XML allow you to say that there's some conceptual relationship among certain tags and or attributes and or, um, well, tags and or attributes within an XML document. That'll become even more useful when in a couple of weeks' time we look not only at DTD, uh, the A language in which you can define the structure of a document formally, but also XML schema, which will use XML namespaces to associate a uh, so-called schema with an XML document. So more on that in the future. For now, you'll continue seeing namespaces by way of this XML NS attribute and using it to define prefixes, even more so now that on the server side, we're going to be increasingly generating XHTML and the like. So SVG was one other thing we looked at with which you played for project two, generating your X2 maps. Uh, in a word, in a sentence, what's SVG all about? It's XML format for vector graphics. Yeah, so it's an X. Perfect. That's sort of everything. So it's an XML-based format for defining vector graphics, which allow us to define shapes, lines, circles, text, even anchors and such, but in such a way that those graphics are scalable. So the fact that you're able to hold Alt or Control and zoom in almost infinitely with Adobe's Viewer, even though eventually it says that's enough, uh, in theory you could scale without loss of fidelity ad infinitum because everything's represented underneath the hood with mathematical formulae even though you yourself don't necessarily have to uh, implement or define those uh, formulae. XSL, FO, AKA XSL. What's that all about? It's another formatting language which allows us to use uh, XSL but to create PDFs, graphics, and other, other formats. Okay, good. So it's a, it's a formatting language as one of its, um, a part of the acronym suggests. It's an XML derivative and it allows us to specify with great precision actually what a document should look like. And using a rasterizer like FOP can we actually convert the FO syntax which is, um, as you've seen, somewhat cryptic looking, maybe similar in spirit though perhaps not quite as sophisticated as something like PostScript, but you can run it through a program and generate things like PDFs or images or other file formats still. So we'll actually employ this again in Project 4 uh, in the context of generating what we'll call purchase orders or receipts, essentially, when a user checks out. So we'll, come, we'll weave that back into the course in a bit. Even though it, too, is called XSL, and even though it was linked early on with XSLT, it's actually rather different um, conceptually as well as in terms of implementation. So you can certainly use them together, but do realize that you need not use the transform transformative version of XSL versus the formatting object version. So this time, so we'll do a bit of an introduction first off as to what HTTP and what web-based development is all about. Um, for those unfamiliar in particular, we'll talk about this general buzzword of, of uh, N-tier enterprise applications or really anything involving those ideas. And then we'll start honing in more specifically on Java server pages, aka JSP, as well as Java servlet. And we'll look at some initial servlets. Uh, we'll introduce project three tonight as well and just generally transition ourselves to the server side. So any questions about those promises? No? All right. So 
Everyone in this room has used a web browser before, and so when you sit down at your computer, and this picture is increasingly dated each year, uh, and connect to what we'll describe as a server here, we have this canonical relationship of clients and servers, and they somehow communicate via the internet. All right, so that's how the internet works. But what's actually going on inside of this transmission if HTTP is the language being used? Well, even if you're only vaguely familiar, what's HTTP? It's clearly something you've typed or seen every day, but Yeah, so it's an application protocol, a language in a sense that two computers, client and server, speak when they want to transfer or request web pages. So put in a nutshell, if you request of CNN the current day's news by just visiting CNN.com, enter. What's really being sent from client to server is a string that generally looks like this, capital get, uh, forward slash for the default root. Uh, followed by the, the version of the protocol being used, which might be 1.0 or 1.1, close quote. And that's essentially what's actually sent over the wire, though there can be some additional information. When the web server receives this message, it sees, OK, well, we want to get something. We, it's this that we want to get. The web server figures out that the absence of an explicit file name typically means uh, what file? default.asp or default.htm or index.html or any of these variants. Though it's arbitrary, there are just conventions in the world. Figures out what file you want, ends up spitting it out um, back over the same socket connection so that the client ultimately receives the day's news, having visited CNN.com. So that's HTTP in a nutshell. If, however, that web page, the day's news, happens to contain images or flash videos these days, um, certainly with HTTP. Um, the latest version incarnations of HTTP, the server can actually keep this so-called socket connection open with the client so that you're not opening multiple connections to download a web page that has, say, a dozen different images and a few sound files, but all of that stuff can be shipped in the same pipe, so to speak. How does a client know upon receiving the HTML file what other files it needs to actually compose this web page? Yeah, so they're hyper-references of sorts embedded in the file. So anything that has a SRC equals quote unquote typically references a file. So that's an indication to IE or Firefox or Safari to go fetch in addition to the HTML file it already has all those other things. So henceforth, I'll certainly assume per the course catalog that everyone in this room knows HTML or XHTML. Even if you've just done little play websites, that's fine. So long as you have the basics. Uh, if you don't, as of tonight, know HTML, make sure you come back next week knowing HTML. And frankly, it's not that all that hard to pick up. Um, pull up any tutorial or email me or Mahesh and we'll give you some suggestions. But it's very simple uh, for what we'll use it for, at least initially, what we'll expect of you, you can just know the basics. That suffices. We're not going to expect works of arts. Works of art. So I know here that there are different types of methods for, for requesting data. This is an example of get, where you just request a web page by pulling up its URL. But there's also this notion of post, which if you've done any web-based software development, you've probably used many a time. What's the difference between get and post exactly? In post, you can send additional parameters. I mean, you can send them in both of them, but in post, you're not limited by the maximum amount of parameters. Yeah, perfect. So when you're sending a get request, as you might have inferred from the story I told in terms of typing cnn.com, enter, the string that's actually sent is effectively what you type after the domain name in the actual URL. And URLs are limited, even though what that limit is is unclear. It sort of depends on server and or browser, are limited to be something finite. And it's maybe safe to assume 1, 1024 characters. But I think I'm not even sure in the RFC if it specifies what the maximum length is. Maybe it specifies a minimum length. But the short of it is, as soon as you start transmitting a lot of data from client to server by way of a browser, you typically want to transition your requests from what's called get, which puts everything in the URL, to post, which hides some of the information elsewhere in the request. And the neatest way to see this, I think, and to make more clear what's really going on, is to use, uh, let's see if I have Firefox on this machine. So let's go ahead and, in the background, I'm going to go ahead and install Firefox here so that we have a, a more versatile browser to play with in a little bit time. 
So I'll get this started in the background. And to be clear, nothing we do in this class will really um, depend on any particular browser. But the other thing I'm going to download is called some, uh, Live Headers, which is a wonderful plugin for Firefox. If you're already a Firefox user, what we are going to use it for is to show us exactly what's going on behind the scenes when we actually uh, make a request of a web page. And shouting out where the download link is. OK, there we go. OK, actually, I'll come back to this page once we have Firefox installed. There's one other tool that's quite neat that um, works well with Firefox but doesn't necessarily require Firefox called Charles. So if you Google Charles and maybe keywords like Firefox, you'll get an even more full-fledged <laughs> toolkit that allows you to do a lot of introspection as to the HTML going across the wire, the CSS going across the wire, the HTTP traffic going across the wire. We won't really dwell on it in class, but we'll show you at least um, live headers, which is just a simpler tool, which just shows us exactly what web browser and what web server are saying to each other. So that should be done in just a moment. In the meantime, let's make note of one other feature before we look underneath the hood. So TCP IP is what? Probably heard it. Seen it in your control panel? What's it all about? It's a transport layer protocol. Oh, good. We got some competition up here today. <laughs> That's fine. So it's, uh, it's go on. It's a transport. OK, uh, so sort of. Well, TCP is, but with TCP IP, which is sort of a misleading. Good. So we'll go with the sort of fluffy, more generalist definition, which is just it's the protocol that computers use to speak on the internet. Technically, it describes two protocols, one of which is uh, transport layer, one of which is internet layer uh, or network layer, um, TCP being a protocol unto itself, and IP being another protocol unto itself. Salient features of each of those are perhaps as follows. No, we don't need that. Um, IP. So you've all heard that before. Every computer on the internet, small white lie, has an IP address. And this is a unique number, 32-bit uh, number, that uniquely identifies your machine on the internet. All right. Uh, so the fact that all computers on the internet speak at least IP just means they all have this ability to not only describe themselves in terms of this number, 1.2.3.4, but also talk to other computers based on that number. It's the computer analog of, say, unique US Postal Service addresses. TCP is a little neater in that beyond just offering, and that is a simplification of IP, but in addition, TCP provides you with guarantees of delivery among other things, which is to say, for the most part, whenever you've used a network-based program and you have a live internet connection and you send a packet from your computer to some server, whether it's to download some music file, whether it's to request a web page or most anything else, there's a guarantee built into this TCP IP protocol stack that that packet is going to reach point B if point B is reachable. Which is to say that even if there are half a dozen or a dozen or more routers in between points A and B, and one of them gets lazy, one of them gets busy, and just drops your data because it's overflowed with other people's data, your computer, assuming it implements TCP IP correctly, will just keep retransmitting your same data again and again and again until it finally gets through, although presumably eventually it will give up. So TCP guarantees delivery, and it also allows you to identify different services on a specific computer. So what do I mean by this? Well, even though we talk generally in terms of a web server and a DHCP server and a DNS server and an email server, technically all of those servers can actually be on the same physical piece of hardware. They all are based on TCP IP, the types of services that I described, though you can actually for some of them use UDP, which is a different protocol altogether. But the means by which then computers on the internet determine whether or not they're talking to, say, the web server or the DNS server or the email SMTP server or something else altogether is by way of unique numbers that have been standardized by the world. Uh, if you want to talk to a web server, you essentially say, in, by way of your message to that server, you, rather, you take your message that you want to send to the web server, you put it in a virtual envelope, if you will, and you put on the front of that envelope the IP address of the computer you're sending it to, namely the IP address of CNN.com, and the port number that you want to access. And the port 
aspect comes from TCP. So specifically, the envelope in which we would put a message like this is not only going to contain the message, but it's going to be addressed to, say, 1.2.3.4, assuming that's CNN's IP address, port 80, which by default is the, web, the port on which web servers run. Uh, SMTP, for instance, is 25. DNS, I don't remember offhand. Random trivia. 53, maybe? I can't remember. Not important. That's what Google's for these days, right? So that's, in a nutshell, more technically what happens when a client like this sends a request for a web page over here. So we introduced this in this course, not so much because we care about how all this XML and Java stuff gets transmitted across the wire, but because of the environment in which you're going to be working. Um, for convenience's sake, you'll continue using your FAS accounts and SSHing to nice.fas.harvard.edu, though you can still develop on your own machines. But when it comes time to actually running your own, uh, doing anything web-based, you won't use FAS's own web server, accessible at www.fas.harvard.edu, because we have no control over that web server. Can't control its configuration file, can't restart it, and so forth. Each of you is going to be running your own instance of a web server, which is consistent with this idea that an individual box, like NICE, which is also a white lie because it's a cluster, but even so, an individual box can run multiple services. Turns out an individual box can run the same service multiple times, but on different ports so that you can uniquely address it. So starting with project three, when you want to pull up, for instance, your web-based portal, which we've playfully dubbed Wahoo, and we'll look at in more detail later today, you'll pull up the, something like the following, HTTP, ICE2, which is a host name among the NICE cluster, .fas, .harvard, .edu, colon, something like uh, 9999, which is going to be a semi-random number that you'll choose to uniquely identify your web server running on the NICE cluster. And I'll walk you through the, uh, the mechanics of that later today. But all that is to say that we're just using standard architecture. So when you in the real world might actually deploy your own servlets or JSPs, odds are you'll run your own web server, be it Tomcat or Apache, on your own box or your company's box, probably on the standard port of port 80, but otherwise everything is the same in theory when it comes to the configuration. It's just a numeric detail. All right, so now that I have got Firefox installed, let's go ahead and run it. I'm going to again install this thing called Live HTTP Headers. Uh, don't bother importing anything. All right, no. Oh. Seem to hear from that phone most every day, yeah? All right, pulling this up. I'm going to go ahead and install it. It's going to complain about this. I'm going to allow, since I don't know. Let's try that again. OK, I have to wait three seconds, because that apparently means I'll now trust it. Restart Firefox, sure, close the tabs. And finally, my browser's back. OK, so let's go ahead and I learned long ago not to bring up actually CNN.com because then everyone gets distracted by the news. And I think at one point there was a big storm and no one was paying attention for the rest of the time I had it on the screen. So give me a really boring website. How about Google's main page? All right, we'll do Google without even pulling anything up. So if I just visit Google, I'm going to get this page, which frankly these days is about as simple as it gets. Um, <laughs> what, though, just happened? Well, I'm going to go to Tools, Live HTTP Headers, and what I'm going to get is this little box here, which is going to show me all of this stuff going on behind the scenes, which is kind of neat. And this will be neater, I think, still, when you're actually working on projects three and four, if you want to do a bit of introspection and see exactly what's going on. Not necessarily to debug things, but if only to really appreciate, oh, that's all that's going on behind the scenes, because much of this is masked otherwise at the Java level or XSLT level from you. So I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing now and reload, which is equivalent to resending that message to Google. So I'll reload. And now notice that what I've got now is a transcript of all of the HTTP requests that just went across the wire, top to bottom. So here's the first. The very first thing sent by Firefox to Google.com was this string, which is almost identical to that, but it's speaking HTTP 1.1, which is nice because it can fetch multiple things at once. It, and then here's my, the first of my white lies. It doesn't just send that typically sends some other information, most of which is irrelevant to us. But just to be clear, it specifies specifically what host name I typed in. This is useful if a web server is running 
multiple virtual servers, not only google.com, but foo.com. They can all live at the same IP address, but this way the browser says, yeah, I'm pulling up 1.2.3.4, but the means by which I got that IP was to look up the IP for google.com, not foo.com. So that's a neat trick. Um, then all this stuff is kind of fluffy. It tells you the browser that was actually used. This is a message from the browser saying what kinds of data it will accept in response. Um, uh, cache con most of this is uninteresting. Cookies we'll come back to in a moment. Cache control is a little interesting as it might affect some of your choices of projects for three, four, or the final project because sometimes you want to um, avoid any caching of data so that you don't get stale web pages. But now notice down here, this is the server's first reply. So the server responds with an OK message and then some of these other headers, so to speak. But after that, it begins to reply with other data or it begins to, my browser went ahead and started requesting things that were embedded in this web page. The first of which is apparently Google's logo. Uh, if we scroll down further to the next line, then it downloaded nav logo three. And that's actually it. So that makes sense. There's this image and there's apparently some other image in there. But that, oh, probably this little thing. But that's it for Google's main page. Okay, so uninteresting now, but now let's actually do a search. Uh, give me a search that's not going to distract people when the results come up. How's the chance for student involvement? No? How about puppies? Let's see what this returns. Okay, we'll ignore that. Oh, how cute. All right, well, let's just add on behind the scenes. Well, notice that the URL changed. So this suggests that even though I just filled out a form, so to speak, it actually used the get method, if only because I promised that get sends all of the information in the URL itself. So embedded in there is some information that's germane only to Google or someone trying to figure out how it all works, but notice that there's a few different strings here. So henceforth, know that anything after a question mark in the URL is a so-called parameter, an HTTP parameter, which, uh, and even that actually probably shouldn't call it an HTTP parameter, is a parameter that is passed to whatever program is sitting on Google server listening for that input. And in this case, it looks like a program of some sort called search. Okay, the question mark separates then the URL, um, the path that I'm requesting from all of these uh, uh, parameters and their values. The first is HL equals EN. Take a guess what this means. Yeah, so it's just English. Ampersands separate, meanwhile, pairs from other pairs. So the next one is Q, probably for query, equals puppies. And then it looks like button G. So this suggests that the name of the button I clicked happens to be called Google Search. A plus sign indicates a space character, and there are other special symbols that sometimes appear in URLs that represent characters so that you don't actually have real spaces in the URL. Let's go back to uh, here. So the last thing that was requested, notice, is looks like a few things went on behind the scenes still. And actually, let's reload and do this again so it's clear what just happened. So now the first thing that was sent was, in fact, this URL. OK, if by contrast, I pulled up a website that has me filling out a form, the re result of which is that the URL does not actually change, odds are the message is sent via post. And we'll come back to post when we actually start playing with some of the examples tonight in project three. And for now, suffice it to say that we, a lot of you are looking at the puppies still, it seems. Suffice it to say that post is often used when you want to transmit more data than, at least in conceptually, might fit reasonably within a URL. Though there are other reasons as well. Any suggestions as to why you might use post, which does not put the parameters in the URL, but instead hides them somewhere else in this envelope? Names and... Yeah, actually, that's perfect. So to hide, to give some degree of privacy, because browsers do tend to cache things in URLs, and the so-called history. Post messages, even though technically they're probably somewhere cached in the browser's memory, or at least on disk somewhere, virtual memory, and those kinds of things, it's not perfectly private. It's at least not by design usually saved for later use or later inspection. So that alone can be a compelling reason, privacy's sake. But more on that in a bit. Any questions thus far on HTTP and such? No? Okay, so there's this one feature of HTTP that we'll actually rely on quite heavily, which is a cookie. So we've all probably heard of cookies before. So 
with that assumption in mind on my part, what are they? So they're stored on the client machines, but what are they? Yeah. So it, they're usually a text file put on your hard drive by a website that contains a key value pairs. And they are used so that the website can remember some amount of information about you. And this slide really is just meant to be a visual cue as to what these things are all about. You don't need to worry about this, um, the, the grammar here, the definition per se. It just happens to be excerpted from the RFC. Incidentally, RFC, request for comments, is for the internet world what recommendations are to the W3C world, which is the word for standard or specification. So the nice cookies are useful for what reason? Exactly, keeping state. So here's the interesting thing. We've not said it thus far, but HTTP is in fact a stateless protocol. As soon as that little globe stops spinning in old versions of IE or the equivalent these days in Firefox and the like, that's it. The web browser has stopped communicating with the server and has closed its TCP IP connection. The implication is that the web server, effective immediately, has probably forgotten who that person is. So the next time I request a web page from the server, it might be coming from the same IP address, but that's not really a guarantee of anything these days given how many people share IP addresses at home, at offices, at universities. So you can't just assume that if Joe Bob previously visited me from 2.3.4.5, that IP address, that if I see that same IP address, it's the same Joe Bob. Could be someone else on his same network. So cookies allow the web server to remember on a per machine basis who someone is. In theory, you can use cookies to store usernames, even passwords, though that's kind of foolish, so that, a web, so that you, the user, the next time you visit that web server, don't have to type, for instance, your username. It's just remembered because it's in this text file, which by design is meant to be read in by the browser anytime you revisit that website. That's the whole purpose of cookies. To, when you pull up CNN.com, the browser is supposed to check its folder of cookies, find CNN.com's cookie, if any, read its variables into memory, and use them, or rather transmit them to the server. So better, though, than storing on the client things like usernames and passwords is instead what most web servers, or more web servers do, which is typically better design, which is to store a unique identifier, like a really big pseudo-random number, and then to store all of the memorable information in the server's memory space, in RAM or on its hard disk. The idea now is that so long as the client has a cookie with, say, a big number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, which in theory uniquely identifies him, because the web server should not be giving that same ID to anyone else, every HTTP request I make from this computer to the server is going to include in those HTTP headers the ID, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. The web server then can say, all right, he can look in his database. I am hearing a request from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Let me look up in my database all of the data I've remembered for this user, maybe username, password, and so forth, and then maybe use that information. We are going to start using this information in Wahoo, for instance, to remember what the user's preferred news feeds are. We're going to use this in Project 4 to remember what the user has added to their shopping cart. Because the alternative to that model is to store, for instance, when you're at Amazon.com, maybe the product IDs of everything you've added to your shopping cart. And the fact of the matter is, that's just not necessary. And also, it's a potential risk of privacy if you're storing so much specific information. Plus, it's just a waste of space on the client. Better is to store that server side, and so we'll be following that model by way of what are called sessions. And we'll look slightly more technically later today and more mechanically in problem set in projects three and four at how to use sessions which simply describes the use of cookies to remember server-side state, like what's in someone's shopping cart or what their preferences are. Yeah? So the first interaction of the browser with the server, it, on the client side, figures out which, client, which cookies are appropriate for, for this URL. Exactly. Packages them up and sends them with the initial request. Exactly. Good question. So it almost seems to be a chicken and the egg problem, but the way it works, and I'll summarize for the camera the answer rather than the question, when the client pulls up CNN.com for the first time, almost every website these days uses cookies, even if they're just on by default for some reason. 
when the client requests CNN.com for the first time, not only does he get back the day's news, that is index.html, he also gets back a cookie. Because the web server will realize, here's a client I've never seen before, because he hasn't given me a cookie, I'm going to give him one back and just therefore invite him to send me back that cookie every time. Even if the web server doesn't need it, it will often send it, just because the website's capable of doing that. Um, in the context of servlets, we'll turn that feature on. And there's often functions you call in other languages, like PHP, session start, which turn on cookies for that reason. Yep, another. Yes, cookies are part of HTTP. In fact, they come from the RFC for HTTP. And when we look closely at what's going across the wire in projects three and four, you'll start to see your own cookies potentially in these headers, headers if you choose to use this Firefox plugin. And incidentally, you can Google around if you're not a Firefox user for other tools. They can sniff HTTP traffic just like this. This one's just nice and easy to use. All right, so let's introduce some terms all toward an end of providing a framework, quite literally, for project three. So without getting too tied into some of the fluffy jargon and focusing more on the, the principles here, uh, if we had just two machines communicating, as we described there, we might call this a two-tier architecture, a client side and a server side. And it pretty much describes the state of the world as you might have known it on day one of learning how uh, servers and clients work. Um, just to summarize, though, what we typically mean by a client, typically it might mean a computer, a machine that presents data aesthetically to the user, actually requests data, but otherwise is subservient to this idea of a server. The server, by contrast, does all the business logic, actually runs code, might have databases, might have access to big data sets that are, in turn, served up to the client. Again, in this sort of subservient relationship, one asks for, of the other for, for things. All right, let's introduce a third layer. Well, for performance reasons, for reliability reasons, for administrative reasons, for other reasons, you might sometimes want to start factoring services out of your boxes um, for all of the reasons I just cited and more. So a typical approach might be to do this. It might have a three-tier architecture where now we have a so-called middle tier, which sits between the back-end servers, the so-called back-end tier, and the client-side tier. But again, the jargon is sort of meaningless. It's the ideas that are somewhat interesting. The reason you might do this is because web server might get a lot of traffic for the web, and you might install appropriate software to optimize delivery of web pages and stuff. But an email server might not be as busy. You might want to have a farm of email servers. You might want to do um, some kind of spam filtering before emails come in or go out. So in short, you might just want, for whatever reasons, to run a separate box. Well, we can just sort of factor out that functionality. So rather than running multiple services on one box, we might quite literally start factoring them out, even though, in theory, we could still have a multi-tier architecture but run everything on the same box. They just somehow intercommunicate, but unnecessarily complicated to Pick, depict it like that. All right, let's take things up a notch, a five-tier architecture. And there's no one way to do this. This is meant just to hint at the ideas uh, herein. For the most part, on nice, we'll stick with the two-tier architecture, just to keep things simple um, and also manageable by someone, particularly those of you who have never configured your own web server before, had much uh, experience in that sense. But other approaches are possible, certainly for the final project. Here we might continue to put the web server as close to the user as possible, but he, in turn, might talk to a so-called application server, which is just a box whose sole purpose in life is to execute code maybe take input, produce output, but not static output, which a web server is typically better versed at for caching reasons and the like. Email server we might have here, and now maybe we'll have a database server. And there could be interconnections here and so forth, but the purpose is we now have access to different services on different boxes. And we'll see in a bit about uh, how we've structured project three to at least be consistent conceptually with this model, even though you'll run it on the same box. And know, incidentally, that Tomcat, as I mentioned um, quickly earlier, is both a web server and an application server. Um, Apache has similar sort of dual functionality these days. So just to put XML into this context, um, historically, XML was sort of originally touted as being a useful uh, technology, so to speak for display of data, right? Especially years ago, and to date, 
there's still this problem of different devices rendering information differently, rendering HTML differently. There are different size screens, for instance. There are different, at least back in the day, different color sets. So maybe you'd have 32-bit uh, color, maybe you just have 16-bit color, things like this. You would have differences in your clients. Well, maybe the solution to this problem is not to have every website in the world hard code little hacks to get their site to work for IE and Firefox and Safari, which is just a pain if nothing else, but why don't we just return the data and let the client render things as he sees fit? Sort of nice in spirit. It hasn't really caught on in this way. To some extent it has, but still not so much. Um, not to the extent that folks perhaps hoped that it would. Um, but um, one of the, I mean, one of the original motivations for XSLT was like, wow, we can just ship down a different style sheet as well as a different XM, uh, as well as the same XML file to different clients, and just let that style sheet render the same data the same. CSS is sort of similar in spirit. You might use different style sheets for different browsers or for different users or different platforms. So same idea, but it turns out that XML is arguably just as, if not more, useful in other tiers, not the client-side tier. In fact, you never really see browsers rendering XSLT, even though they can. At least IE can, because it comes with uh, MSXML built in. You can even download the latest version. It's just uh, Microsoft's parser. And I think uh, when I was out for that lecture, but in the video, I may have demonstrated um, the rendering using IE of a style sheet on an XML file, but you just don't see that done. So um, the story is nice, but in reality, it hasn't quite happened that way. Um, so this summarizes some of the things we just said. Well, what about moving XML to the middle tier? Well, what do we mean by this? Well, and we'll come back to this later in the course when we look at SOAP and web services. Turns out that XML is incredibly useful, if verbose, for letting different services talk to one another. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you essentially want to implement remote procedure calls, we have access to a whole bunch of extant technologies, COM, DCOM, EJBs, CORBA, if you've heard, any of these, um, heard of any of these technologies, they essentially allow you to do that. Write code on this machine that somehow executes code on this machine and gets the response back on this machine. It's sort of an RPC in the most basic sense. But there are some ups and downs, of, upsides and downsides of each of those. For the most part, all of those are proprietary or they're tied to a specific platform, be it Microsoft or a Java platform and so forth. Um, they are not human readable, the data that's going across the wire necessarily. It's often binary objects, which might be fine. They're say, uh, arguably, it's much more efficient that way. But one of the most compelling aspects of XML, frankly, especially as bandwidth's increasing and CPU's increasing, is that eh, it's nice to be able to just transmit text across the wire, particularly text that zips up very well. I mean, one of the things we saw, and this window now is blank, but one of the things we did see from my browser is this willingness, by way of one of those headers, I accept gzip packets, which is to say that if, my bra if a web server wants, it can actually gzip, which is like a Linux equivalent of the zip, uh, pkzip, uh, can zip up a web page, ship it across the wire so it was to send fewer bits, and then my browser will unzip it before showing it to me. The presumption being that CPUs are faster than our networks, essentially. The bottleneck is in the network, not so much at the client or at the server side. So um, XML, because it's just text, frankly, tends to zip up pretty well. So frankly, even shipping verbose XML data, as we'll see when we get to SOAP and web services, arguably not such a big deal. Plus, it's just nice. RSS, how many of you use RSS readers? Okay, it's sort of not necessarily the middle tier here, but I actually you can make that argument. If you have a server that serves up RSS, like a blogging site, and your client, well, RSS is really the middleman, the format in which you're exchanging data. It's purely human readable. It's very easy to parse. You've written an XML parser already. So arguably, that fits into the so-called middle tier now as well. It's just convenience. And that's the thing. I mean, that's the irony about XML. At the end of the day, it's open tag, close tag. Right? And that is fundamentally not all that amazing. But people have really begun using it for some interesting purposes, in part because it's human readable, perhaps in larger part because it's so damn simple. Right? Everyone can generate text and anyone can parse text, especially when you can pull parsers off the shelf these days for free. So another use of XML, um, certainly originally, was for uh, the sake of intercompatibility. So here's sort of a fluffy 
uh, manager's view of the problem where if you're running some business that has a whole bunch of servers, legacy servers, HR servers and the like, if it's expensive, it's non-trivial to have a bunch of consultants come in if you buy some new piece of hardware or software that needs to hook into those systems. Better would be a world in which all of these machines, even if they themselves are proprietary, export or can import XML data. You see this reality even with MySQL. You can dump a MySQL database into a big XML file Part, largely for portability's sake, because you can then import that and parse that data and suck it into some other system. So XML is just a nice middleman, so to speak. And this picture sort of paints that vision. And what about the back end here? Um, here too, you can use XML in the context of actual databases. There are actually things called XML databases, which I think are the research into them and the performance of them is perhaps increasing, even though they're not terribly popular, I would say, just yet. But there's um, a nice argument to make about the, accessi um, the accessibility of data when you can think of it in terms of location paths, a la XPath. And we'll see in a couple of weeks uh, XQuery, which is an even more powerful uh, uh, implementation of this idea of a query language like XPath, much more uh, more similar in power to SQL um, and perhaps offers other features as well. So in short, XML in theory can live in the back end tier, but really the ultimate question is where does it make sense? And what we would put forth to you as a course is that there's no one right answer to this, but hopefully you'll exit this course at least with some clues as to where it might make sense to use XML. And often it's a quick and dirty way to get yourselves up and running, whether it's with a configuration file thing like I preached early on in the course, or in some of these more interesting opportunities. So this picture that we're painting here is of a typical J2EE arch architecture, if you will, though even that's debatable, where essentially things are all factored out into distinct units that perform some fairly isolated task with the client side on the front and maybe the data side on the back end. Presentation layer would typically have your web servers and the like, um, and or your business logic layer would have similar logic. EJB is a, lot, a bunch of stuff we don't focus on so much in this course, but the general principles we do borrow from, in, as we will in Project 2's arch, 3's architecture. Any questions thus far? No? Okay, why don't we go ahead and take our five minute break here, and we'll resume with JSPs and servlets. <coughs> All right, we're back. So what I went ahead and did is open up this file called get.html, which you have a printout of and will be available online. It's really just a quick and dirty example of the types of fields you can use in an HTML form. I'll again assume that most of you are familiar with this, but if not, I would just Google around about uh, HTML forms after tonight. Uh, so long story short, these are the basic building blocks of input um, provision to a web server by way of a web page. Google had this. We had a big text field, and we also had a submit button. I, too, have those in this simple example, as well as a little select menu, as it's called, a checkbox, and then these radio buttons, as they're called. All right, so what I'm going to run on the server, though, is the following. So it turns out, because Java comes with most uh, the proverbial kitchen sink, writing a web server in Java takes only that many lines of code, and most of them are comments. So this is what, uh, I think I took this from, yep, a nice article online on Lycos years ago now. And this is just a class called Diag Server, which extends a built-in class called Network Server. And essentially, the sole purpose of this web server is going to be to listen for HTTP connections on some specified port on this box, and then to echo back, I believe, the response. I'll just print it to the screen so we can see what's going on. So I'm going to go ahead and compile this, as you might expect, with Java C. I'm now going to, uh, actually, let me just double check one thing. Diag server.java, port 80. Uh, OK, yep, I want to specify a specific port. So I'm going to run Java of Diag server. And I'm going to somewhat arbitrarily choose, say, uh, 9876 for my port number. Anything above 1024 is probably fine, because on these systems, nice on which I am, uh, odds are no one else is really running their own web service. We tend to be among the few, if any, courses that actually do this. So you have about 65,000 possible numbers to choose from without accidentally choosing another student's. 
Uh, if over the course of the term you have implemented Wahoo and you're pulling up your website and it looks a lot better than yours, um, odds are you've just chosen someone else's port number somehow. So double check. All right, so I'm going to run this thing on port 9876. If I do a check now, oh, notice incidentally I'm on ICE 1. So even though you've been SSHing to NICE, now it begins to matter which box in the cluster you've been assigned to, which is why we added it to your uh, prompt so it would just be blatantly obvious constantly where you are. So this box is called ice1.fas.harvard.edu. So I'm going to actually go to that URL, uh, ice1.fas.harvard.edu, colon, and that's the means by which you explicitly specify a port. Normally, 80 <laughs> is assumed, which means you don't have to type it. But I'm going to hard code it now as this. It looks like nothing came up. But if I tab back to the window, what this program, this web server again is designed to do is just dump the request that it receives. So as such, I've sort of implemented myself by frankly compiling someone else's code the same idea as that uh, Firefox plugin. But we can use this now to see in uh, uh, layout that's more consistent now with NICE. We're not just doing this with entirely within Firefox, but we're now actually interfacing with our actual server. We can see what goes across the wire when I submit a form. So notice that I'm going to go to my local machine here in today's example 7 directory. And I'm going to open get.html and here's the source code. It's small, but we're not going to dwell here very long. I'm just going to check the action at value for the form so that it's going to get submitted to the right place. And I'm going to go in here and change this to 9876 uh, so that it goes to the right place. Notice I've specified a method of get, and then I just have all these fluffy little input types. Okay, that's what creates this web page. I'm going to reload the page that I already showed you. And now I'm going to type foo. I'm going to type in David. I'm going to check the number 1. I'll check the box. I'll choose 1 for quux, and I'll call this a comment. And now I'll click Submit. Okay, nothing again happened because the web server is not responding to the browser, but it is responding to the console. So what was just sent by my browser was this string, which because now I have full control over the web page, unlike Google, we can be a little more uh, controlling of what gets sent. So I'm requesting the root of my web server, which again is this dummy program. Question mark means here comes the parameter value pairs. Foo's value is David. Bar's value is 1. Baz's value is on. Quux is one, and quux, double quux is comment, and then we just have the protocol and version. And all this stuff it just got sent for free by the browser, trying to tell the server what it's capable of, essentially. By contrast now, let's open up post.html, which is identical in appearance, but if I look at the source code of this thing, which I shall, I'm going to fix the port to be 9876. But notice the only difference now in this file is this. I changed the method from get to post. Not really warranted in this case because it's such a quick and dirty program, but it's going to illustrate what the different request looks like for us. So now I'm going to go back to my console. Let me clear this window. Tidy it up. I'm going to get rid of that. So I'll get rid of Firefox altogether now. And I will go to here. I'm going to type the same things. David. Okay, one, we'll check that, one, and comment. So again, I'm at post.html. I'm going to submit the post request now. And, oh, I didn't reload after changing the port. So let me fix that. Okay, reloaded. David, one, check, one, comment, enter. There we go. So now notice that the post only specifies in the top line the where to send the information to. There's all of those headers again, but now notice the actual request is sent way down here. The reason being, now because one of these headers is called the content length header, the protocol allows, you to, allows the browser to specify how many bytes of input are coming, not in the URL, which eventually has some limits, so you shouldn't trust that it can be infinitely long, but rather all of the data now is going to get sent down here onward. And because we're telling the browser or the server the length of it, it can figure out over how many characters it must iterate before reaching the end, or how many bytes it can read in binary form before reaching the end. So besides privacy, and besides the length of maybe the inputs the user might type, what's another compelling reason to use post as opposed to get? Sorry? When the data is big, what's an example of a big piece of data that you might want to send to a web server? 
binary files, like uploading a file, going to Flickr, going to Facebook, MySpace, any of these photo-oriented websites, perfect examples of a site where you might want to post binary data, certainly won't fit in the URL, but via this mechanism can you post that binary data. Turns out it's not going to be posted per se as zeros and ones, but it will usually be encoded somehow, so it looks almost like ASCII characters. Depends on the um, specifics, but HTTP I believe does that. Um, and then uh, you'll know the browser will or the server will know how much is there again by that header. So the point here is just to illustrate what's going on behind the scenes. And here too, can you poke around? Come projects three and four. Yeah. How do, uh, when it's sending binary data? So I believe when binary data is being uploaded. You know, I'd have to check. I'm not, I've never actually looked at the inside of a packet if you have not only binary data, but also other fields. So I would have to check, to be honest. Does it use mine? But how does it separate it aesthetically from the other variables? I'm not even sure. OK. I'm not sure offhand. But if you whip up a quick web page that has a file field and the appropriate tags, you could certainly add it to this very program, and you'd actually see the example. Other questions? No? This, yeah. This is all text-based and protocol defined in terms of. Correct. HTTP is just pure text, and which is why it encodes using uh, you propose what basic def mime. Mime, so some kind of MIME encoding to actually upload the data. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, I, I actually have to take the fifth on this because I've seen this before, but I'm not sure why that's coming across and let. Oh, you know what it is? I, I think because I've used this browser earlier today to pull up various websites on FAST, it's possible that some. Actually, I think that is what it is. Um, so I think some of the cookies that maybe my other course's website spits out or the pin authentication stuff that Harvard uses, which I think is the culprit. Uh, when you send a cookie from server to browser, you specify the domain for which it's valid. It can only be for your domain, but if you have subdomains, you can specify that this cookie is for harvard.edu, or more specifically, fas.harvard.edu, or more specifically, um, mailin.fas.harvard.edu's machines. So what I think is happening is I think the pin folks return a cookie that's valid for all of harvard.edu. My browser still has that cookie and thus is shipping it up in this connection. So good question. I think that's where it comes from. So for our purposes, it's just a distraction right now. But it's actually a good example of how cookies themselves are sent. They're just sent in the HTTP headers. OK. I think, um, let's see, we looked at that, that, uh, post. Uh, there's this file I gave you source code for HTTP.CGI. It's just a Perl uh, script that allows us to similarly do this introspection. I'm going to wave my hands at it. But for those of you who know Perl, you might find it interesting. But let's go ahead and take a look now at what we're going to be doing on the server side. So JSPs are essentially uh, allow you to, JSP essentially allows you to include Java code within a file that is intermingled usually with other types of code, like HTML. So any of you who have coded PHP before or used Perl for CGI stuff, have coded ASP, JSPs is sort of Java's answer to that same idea. It can be used poorly in that it tends not to be a great principle to intermingle aesthetic stuff like HTML and commingle it with uh, logic like JSPs. Actually, I can relate it more, uh, more relevantly to um, this class. When we've been intermingling HTML or XHTML and XSLT, sort of the same idea. But JSP is like that same idea, but substituting Java for XSLT. So we too have been using it. And in limited form, it certainly is reasonable. But um, it, uh, there are mechanisms and infrastructures that allow you to integrate Java more cleanly into your code. And one of those ways is what's called uh, Java servlets. Um, and actually, before I get ahead of myself, let me note that here's a quick and dirty example of a JSP. This is Hello World written in JSP. All of this is HTML, except for the little uh, scriptlets here, which are demarked by open bracket um, uh, percent sign. And then we call out, which essentially is system.out, the analog in this world of web pages, dot print, 
hello world. And then over here, I've got my semicolon and then the close tag. So that's it. If you pull up this file with a web server or an application server that supports JSP, before spitting that data out to the user, it will parse, it will execute anything between these open brackets and percent signs, figure out what the results are, which clearly should just be hello comma world, and then return that result. So it's server side executed. The browser should never see these open bracket percent signs. Okay. Um, here's another way just so you know it exists, but it's a very tedious way of writing things. Uh, it wouldn't be XML if there weren't a way in XML to implement these same things. And you can use scriptlet tags, which rather than using the nicer or quicker syntax of open bracket per, um, percent sign, you can actually be more explicit. And here comes a little JSP script. So know that syntax exists, but arguably not so much fun to use. All right, so what about a servlet? So servlets tend to be, or are, purely written in Java. There's no intermingling of HTML unless you yourself start calling print a line a lot, or uh, print to actually print hard-coded HTML. But there are other mechanisms for that. Servlets tend to work nicely with JSPs in that you can write a JSP much like you would an XSLT style sheet and have actual XHTML in there and have blocks of code, like a, the equivalent of a for loop, so that you can iterate over some data set, like a node set, and generate some XHTML dynamically. But the means by which you can generate the node set that your JSP iterates over would be to use a servlet, which is like truly factoring out the logic from the actual last mile, the last aesthetic mile, the display of that data. And we'll see examples of this over time um, a servlet container, just to toss the jargon out there, is just a server that knows how to process these things called servlets. So it's a, uh, well, that's about it. Uh, uh, the example we'll rely on is Tomcat, but there's a whole bunch of them. So almost anyone doing J2EE development, anyone doing server-side Java development, is probably using one of these application servers these days to process the Java code and execute it. We'll use Tomcat, BAA's got a popular product, uh, JBoss is popular, Oracle's got their own, Sun's got their own, and there's um, more presumably still than these, but these are among some of the more popular ones. So here's a summary in unfortunately many words of what goes on when you request a web page from a server that is run uh, by servlets as opposed to static HTML files. Step one, the client accesses the server and makes an HTTP request. So that's the picture we were painting up here before. Same as always. Step two, the request is received by the web server and then passed off to the servlet container. So already here we have this notion of uh, multiple tiers, where the web server is just sitting there waiting for requests. And when it realizes, oh, this request is for a JSP or a Java file, a servlet, let me just pass the buck to someone who knows how to process those requests. Because a web server typically just spits out the actual HTML and CSS and graphical data and the like, assuming that's how you've configured your architecture. Um, the servlet container determines what servlet to invoke. And what I mean by that, we'll make clear with an example in a moment. But essentially, calls the servlet, runs it on the user's input, figures out what the result is, hands the result back to the web server and says, here's your data, here's your markup language, go send this back to the user. Um, finally then, um, the web server goes ahead and returns the actual data. And I sort of combined a couple of those steps into multiple ones, but this will be even more clear, I think, by example, when we simply pull up a web page that's generated by one of our own servlets. Questions, though, before we flip the page? Yeah. Exactly. So, and I'll, I'll repeat for the camera. So, URLs we will see get bound to specific servlets, that is, specific Java files on the server side. And we'll see that in the context of files called web.xml, which are configuration files that um, Tomcat uses to provide that mapping between URL and Java class that you want to handle the request. In fact, we'll make this more real now by looking at the two packages in which most of the relevant stuff exists. So we promised, I think in lecture one, 
that the course will ha expect that you just download Java to standard edition version, whatever, and will add to that distribution the pieces of Java to enterprise edition that we choose to use. So in the uh, appendix, actually, for project three, when you download and install Tomcat and actually add some jar files here and there, what you're really doing is supplementing J2SE with some features of J2EE, just the ones we actually care about. So know that that's what you're using, Java 2 EE um, henceforth. And let's take a look now at a couple of examples that actually make real what we just described. So I'm going to go ahead into the examples directory for tonight, and I'm going to go into base. So inside of base, which is a subdirectory here, there's four directories which are representative of a small Tomcat setup for an application. We'll see in a bit that Project 3 is similarly structured. All right, so what does this thing look like? Um, let's go ahead into conf. And there's a few files. And I would urge you to look at all these files, even though you don't need to care so much about all of the specifics. But one you will need to know, and Project 3 walks you through this, is that this is the configuration file, which looks a bit ugly given my font size, in which you specify the port on which your server is going to be running. Okay, and we tell you at the top of this file what you need changed, but I'm going to go ahead and somewhat arbitrarily choose port 8081 here for the shutdown port, even though we tend not to even use that one. And then down here, there's another port attribute, which I'm going to say 8080. Again, sort of arbitrarily, but it's somewhat of a convention. And that's it. The rest of this essentially uh, configures the, web uh, the Tomcat instance, that is the web server, to know about the structure of this application that I'm about to host. So in a nutshell, and Project 3 walks you through this a bit more carefully, I believe, this line here is specifying that the server is going to run on localhost. Look in the web apps directory for the applications that we're about to play with. And then some other stuff. All of those files can, in turn, be found in a root subdirectory. And we'll see this in just a moment. I'm going to ignore the other configuration files, because you yourselves don't have to touch them. Although, is that, do I want to take that back? Yep, I'm going to ignore those. And now I'm going to go back to the root of this application. Temp just needs to be there. By default, it's empty. Work just is put there by Tomcat while working. Puts, its temp, puts some of its, ironically, temp files in there. Um, let's go into web apps. Here's the interesting stuff. I'm going to go into the root directory, and we saw that mentioned a moment ago. And here are essentially the files in my, um, what will be in my web server. Think of this as the Apache version of htdocs, if you're familiar with Apache, or public, public underscore html, essentially. So we're going to pull up in a moment a few different JSP files to see them in action. And then there's also some servlets inside this web INF directory. But let's start with the, serv uh, with the JSPs. I'm going to go back to the base. And as Project 3 will have you do, um, we have installed Tomcat, the latest version, on NICE in such a way that you can run it, that is, spawn your own web server, just by running Tomcat in the directory uh, for your application. In this case, it's our Lecture 7 dummy application. For you, it's going to be the directory called Project 3 8.0. Okay, and you'll also have to choose your port first. So you're going to get some somewhat cryptic messages talking about uh, when the server started up and what started up. So long as you don't see any warnings or errors, they're fine. You can largely ignore the info messages. But notice that it does say that it's initializing, initializing Coyote, the web server, on port 8080. And servlet engine got started, so that's a good thing, presumably, as well. And some other stuff happened. So now, notice I'm on ICE 1 still, port 8080. Let's now pull that up. I'm going to change my 9876 to 8080, enter. And now I see a directory listing. And even though I'm on ICE1.FAS, you might think that, hmm, I've just pulled up the web server that someone at Harvard is running. But notice if I kill the server with Control-C, and reload this page, it's clearly my server that I just pulled up, even though this looks similar to any web server's directory listing, and uh, IE just lied to us and gave us back the same page. It's not actually running. So let's go ahead and rerun the server. It takes a moment to start up. Reload now. It's definitely there. And I'm going to go ahead and pull up Hello1, my first JSP. Very underwhelming. But it worked, at least. In fact, if I look at the source code, even though the font will be a little big, there's none of those scriptlets. There's none of those open bracket percent sides. They were, in fact, executed server side, as expected. 
Uh, hello2.jsp is just the scriptlet version, so it too works the same. Happy end is something that we'll tend to provide you with for the projects. Um, it produces the output of uh, environment check. That is a command we've had you run at your command line to make sure you're good to go. This just dumps that same kind of output to the browser so you can make sure that your own box, especially if you're developing not on NICE but your own system, is configured with the right versions, lest that be relevant to some feature of code that you're using. And it looks like, yep, I got Xerxes 2.7.1 and Zalin 2.7.0 and Java version 1.5.0 uh, update 13. And the updates for this course don't so much matter, but do make sure you're using 1.5.0. Maybe 1.6.0 would work, but most of this software um, from Apache has not been tested with that thus far, to my knowledge. All right, well, after that, um, we don't appear to have a web INF directory, because in fact, that thing is hidden from view by way of some configuration files. So I'm going to go back into web apps, back into root, and now dive into web INF, and I'm going to ignore xml.jsp. It's not all that interesting for tonight's purposes. And now I'm going to go into classes. And notice, here are three Java classes. All right, so now we're making some progress. I'm going to go ahead and open up hello.java. And notice that all it takes to write what's called a Java servlet is, as is the case in the world of Java, just extend someone else's work. It happens to be called HTTP servlet. Notice the packages I've included are these up here, two of which I promised in that last slide. If I scroll down, what I'm going to do is a few things. I'm going to specify the MIME type that I'm about to return which is going to be text slash HTML. I'm going to just get a reference to what's called the writer, the equivalent of system.out for web pages. And now, and this is a bit of a hack, but it's for demonstrative purposes here. I'm just calling print line a bunch of times and outputting some hard-coded HTML just to generate a simple web page. But that's it. That's the end of the servlet. So, Notice, though, that in the parent directory, there was this file called web.xml, which I mentioned is our config file. And it's in this file where we have this mapping now between URL and classes. So scrolling down here, I see the following. The servlet called hello will be mapped to the class called hello. Similarly, we're going to see in a moment something called parameters, parameters, visits, visits. But down here, here's the path. So I'm ar somewhat arbitrarily saying that any URL that looks like slash servlet slash hello should be mapped to the servlet called hello, which in turn maps to the servlet uh, class named capital hello. Okay, so this URL goes to this servlet, which goes to this class. And that's all. I could have chosen foo slash bar slash badge slash hello, so long as I then pulled up that URL. All right, so before looking at these other two servlets, which are more interesting than hello, let's go ahead and actually, can't forget to compile the code. We'll automate this task for you with an ant task so that it gets dumped not in the same directory as your source, but into a build directory, essentially. But I'm going to go back to the root here, type tomcat. Now that I have those class files, and I'm going to go back here, and again, still doesn't appear, but by that imaginary URL, I'm going to go to servlet hello, and there it is. There's that servlet. Okay. If I now navigate back to that directory, let's take a look at those other two guys and see what they're capable of. Parameters is, again, a little uh, demonstrative application that this time is going to output a MIME type of text plane. It's just going to be for demo purposes. Here's that same reference to a uh, writer. And now it looks like the means by which you get the HTTP parameters that were submitted to a web server is to call request.getParameterNames. And if we look up the Java doc for this method, we'll see that it returns an enumeration, which is the generic Java type. The place that I took request from is this. Notice that the method we're in right now is this method called doGet, which takes a reference to a request object and a response object. And much like default handler gave you a lot of methods for free, same deal here. Because parameters extends HTTP servlet, I'm just overriding the built-in method called do get to make sure that any time a get request is passed to the servlet, this method gets called. Take a guess what other methods exist. Do post, right? So there too, and we'll see a way, um, we'll see that one in project three. All right, so now I have a data structure of Java. Um, if you're not familiar with enumerations and linked lists and these things, this too is something the course assumes. So best to bring yourself up to speed or ask questions of the staff. But now, 
All this program is going to do is demonstrate how I can iterate over these parameters. Quick dummy application, but this basic building block should prove quite useful in project three, when you actually need to take input from the user and do something with it. So while params has more elements, I'm going to grab the next element, casting it to a string, because I just know that stored in this enumeration are a bunch of strings, because they're HTTP parameters, which is just ASCII text. Then I'm going to print that parameter, followed by a colon, followed by its value. All right. How did I know that these methods existed? Well, again, the course's Java doc will be your friend. So computer science 259, click resources as always. And then at the top near our APIs, now henceforth, you can begin playing in the Java servlet API. So I'm going to go here and let's go to, let's find this guy, an HTTP servlet request, since that's where I took this stuff from in the first place. So here we are, it's an interface. I'm going to scroll down, and here's a bunch of methods. So get, uh, what did we call? Request get parameter names, must come from somewhere else. So let's take a look. Here it is, get parameter names, and there it is. It returns an enumeration, and the Java doc qu quite simply explains that it returns a bunch of strings, which are the parameter names. Clearly, there are some other methods here, get parameter values, get parameter map, get parameter, and so forth. So this isn't the only way to get at that data, but it's one of the ways. And we as a course would refer you to the Java doc for other ways, that certainly. That's it. That's all this program's going to do. So let's run this. So I'm still running my web server. I'm going to go back to that tab and go not to hello, but parameters, I think. And I didn't get anything back, but <laughs> How do I pass a parameter called foo with a value of bar to this servlet? Yeah. Good. Too easy. Yeah, there it is. Let's do another one. How do I separate them? Yeah, percent equals, let's say, quux. And there we go. And repeat, repeat, repeat. Simple example, but demonstrates how you can get access to that data in a servlet. So already pretty cool. Now let's take things one step further and look at visits.java and see how we can use this notion of a session, which is pretty cool. So this demonstration does the following. I'm going to explicitly get the parameter called user. I'm going to check if it's null, then let's just, um, let's just terminate, forget it. There's no purpose to this demo. Next, I'm going to grab from the request the session object. So as promised before, because of cookies, there's this server-side state that you as the server-side developer have access to, and it's generally called a session. The servlet container, that is Tomcat, makes that available to you. You yourselves never have to write a cookie. You can just assume that when you call get session, the servlet container, Tomcat, figures out what the user's unique cookie is, what that cookie maps to in your database on the server side, and what it hands you is a session object, an HTTP session object, that is effectively a hash table that you can start plugging val keys and values into. And Tomcat takes care of storing that away and making sure that the next time the user hits reload or clicks another URL, you get those same variables back. It's really cool, frankly, how, how much you get for free just by calling this method. So now I have a reference called sesh to an HTTP session. And all I'm going to do is this. You have to realize that because at the end of the day, all of these things are Java collections, you can't just store primitives in them. If you're storing key value pairs, you can store objects. So the goal of this program is just to keep track of the number of times each user has visited. So the goal here is to do the following. First, well, actually, let's ignore this for a moment. How do you remember how many times the user has been here? Well, I'm going to call set attribute on the session, passing in a key and a value. The key is going to be called user. And recall that we got that from the user parameter. So it's going to be mailin or something like that, whatever I type in the get string. And then I'm going to store a new integer object, which turns out is the result of visits int value plus one. So ugly syntax, but all this is doing is taking the current number of visits for this user, incrementing it by one, and storing that value in a new integer object. Because again, with Java collections, you can store keys and values where those values are references to objects, which is why we have to jump through these hoops. Where did I get visits from? Well, to get something from the session, I call sess.getAttribute, and then what it's called. 
I know this thing's going to be an integer because I put it there. So I'm going to cast it explicitly back to an integer object. I'm going to call it visits. I'm going to do a quick check if it's null. If it's null, let's set visits equal to the integer object with the value 0 inside. And just if you're not familiar with the integer class, if you call the object dot int value, it returns the primitive, which I can then add to this primitive or this constant 1, and then pass that whole answer, which the second time the user visits will be 2, back to the constructor for the integer class, which gives me another object which stores the value 2. Okay. Fortunately, you don't typically have to jump through all of these hoops because you won't often just be storing numbers. You'll be storing strings, for instance, and strings are already objects, so the problem sort of goes away. But we're kept a little conceptually simpler, but syntactically more complicated for this demo. So let's see the result. It's already compiled. I'm going to go to visits and remind me, what am I going to see when I hit enter now? Not one, not two. Exception. Because if I fail to provide that username, recall that my code was designed to trigger an exception, which is one of these famed uh, HTTP 500 errors. But I did provide an error message, which is useful for me right now, missing user parameter. So now let's fix this. And I didn't have to bail. I could have printed a nice pretty error message, but useful to see what the exceptions will do for us in this context. Question mark, user equals mailin. Enter. Fixed. OK, notice no state. The browser has disconnected from the server. If I hit reload, though, the server seems to know how many times I've been there. Reload, 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 and so forth. The server's counting up the number of times. If, however, I'll copy the URL, but I close this tab, now open a new tab and go back there, it's still remembered. Because it's using a uh, session cookie, so to speak, which usually means that, by default, the browser, as long as the browser's process is running in RAM, it remembers the cookie. If I kill the whole browser, though, and now reload a new browser instance altogether, assuming IE behaves as I expect, there we go. It reinitialized it. So the cookie here, by default, the session object by default, seems to only exist for the life of the browser window. If, by contrast, you want more persistent cookies, you'll need to make more specific method calls to actually have the data persist across browser processes. But for the most part, those kinds of sessions are sufficient, these um, lives of the browser sessions. And that's what many websites, most websites, probably tend to use. Yeah, questions? When you did the uh, get attribute, uh, does, that, huh? does, does that also remove that from the attributes list? Good question. No. It doesn't remove, it doesn't pop anything out of the session. It just retrieves the value. Oh, OK. So you could have really. Since that's an object, you could have just incremented that, and it would have incremented the object that would still be on the list, right? I mean, you, you don't really need to do the set attribute in this case. It's uh, a good question. I forget in the integer class if you can change the primitive tucked away inside of it. No? OK, so no, um, which is why I had to create a new object altogether mm -hmm. and plop it back in. But because I gave it the same name, it clobbers the old object. OK. Other questions? No? OK, so let's come back here for a moment. Sessions, I present this pictorially with the shopping cart, but we'll see in Project 4 that it allows us to implement precisely that idea. In Wahoo, it will allow us to implement the notion of um, uh, user's preferences. There is one, um, one matter, which those of you not too familiar with multi-threaded programming, that's worth noting. So in, I think, Wahoo, Yes, in Wahoo, you'll see that we have the we use the word synchronized. Uh, I think that's the, I'm forgetting my Java. Synchronized, the right keyword, Java? Yep, OK, so synchronized. Among Java's nice features is that simply by way of this keyword, you can essentially prevent multiple threads from calling the same method simultaneously. Well, why is this useful? Well, notice that I only wrote one copy of, for instance, um, the visits servlet. And with Wahoo, which is even more sort of compelling, we're only going to write one login servlet, one preferences servlet, one view servlet. But in theory, thousands of people might be using my portal simultaneously. And ergo, the same methods, called foo, for instance, might be called by multiple users simultaneously. And that's fine in theory. But if any of your methods use global variables or share some memory space that uh, they uh, share some memory space, 
you have this potential problem about synchronization. And by that I mean if two different users visits to your web page might trigger invocation of the same method and both instances both invocations of that method try to check the value of some variable or change the value of some variable one might not happen before both uh, the second might start executing while the other is still executing simply because of the way of how a CPU or the JVM handles multi-threaded programs the implication is that the users um, the data returned to the user might not be as you expect. And this will be easier to discuss in, with concrete examples once we start playing around with the projects and you perhaps trip over this issue in your own code. But know for now the following real world example. A wonderful example I learned way back when uh, taking an operating systems course was uh, a dormitory with two roommates and a fridge that is, uh, has no milk left. So suppose one roommate comes home, opens the fridge for a bottle of milk and realizes, ah, they're, we're out of milk closes the fridge to save energy, walks to the store to go buy some milk. Meanwhile, roommate number two comes home, also is thirsty, opens the fridge, realizes there's no milk, closes it, heads to the store. In technical terms, they both check the value of some variable, which is zero, which did mean, meant compelled them to go to the store. Meanwhile, roommate one, he went to a different store, comes home first, opens the fridge, increments the variable by one, now we have one bottle of milk. Roommate two comes home, opens the fridge, damn, there's already milk, now we plus plus again, there's two bottles of milk, which is not the goal. We don't drink enough milk, it's going to spoil, this was sort of a bad end result. So that's sort of the silly real world example. But it illustrates the problem of shared memory space, even something trivial conceptually like a global variable or a static variable. So how could the two roommates solve this problem so that they never end up with two bottles of milk and thus one wasted? Leave a note. Perfect. Better yet, padlock the thing so that the other roommate can't get, even, get, get in. And I suggest that only because the nomenclature in programming is to actually use a lock or a semaphore, uh, which is just this um, usually operating system or language construct that allow you to prevent other threads, aka other methods, from entering the same chunk of code simultaneously. So Java provides you with this ability with the keyword synchronized you essentially can declare that a method is synchronized, which means that the JVM will only let one thread call that method at once. Unfortunately, if you have a lot of looping in that method, if it just takes a really long time to execute, you could grind your whole application to a halt because only one guy can go through there at once. And for a web server with hundreds, thousands of users simultaneously, you don't want big, long, slow, synchronized methods. So the rule of thumb is to keep these things as short as possible to wrap only the delicate code whose execution needs to be atomic. So we use this actually in Wahoo not because there's a huge probabilistic risk of state getting messed up because it is important to realize that any time you start doing this multi-threaded um, server coding, which you are by nature with servlets, you have to at least appreciate these issues. Otherwise you're going to get these non-deterministic bugs that are hard to troubleshoot just because only once in a while do threads actually um, cause the, the problems to become manifest. So realize that in the fridge example really captures exactly the problem at hand. So in short, if you ever use some shared memory space within servlets that multiple, that one or more methods might try to access, consider synchronizing the code and preventing um, multiple threads from entering at once. All right, so project three is all about making your own Yahoo-like web portal. Simpler than Yahoo, but one that it's going to allow a user to log in with the username and password, and if they don't have such, to register. A uh, portal that's going to allow users to browse available feeds of news in different categories and subscribe to their favorite ones. And then also a portal that has some kind of personal touch, maybe the ability to look up weather by pulling it from some third-party website, looking up news tick, uh, stock tickers, sports scores, anything like that. The spec elaborates. The architecture that we are going to employ is essentially this. So we sort of model things in a way that it has conceptually three different tiers, even though all this stuff's going to be happening on your own client and our server, nice. However, per the appendix, you can do all of this stuff, which is pretty cool on your own Windows machine, Mac machine, uh, Linux machine, so long as your code ultimately works on NICE and uh, compiles and gets submitted there. There's going to be three servlets involved in this application. A login servlet, which we've actually written for you and handles the process of letting a user log in and register. The pref servlet, the view servlet, unfortunately, do nothing. 
what they should hopefully eventually do is the view servlet should let the user look at the day's top articles. And this is current news. It's a live feed of data uh, from a source called moreover.com, freely available XML data. The view servlet should let me see today's top stories and the categories I care about, the ones I'm subscribed to. The pref servlet should allow me to change my preferences and what I subscribe to. The news provider class and user manager class we provide to you. Um, this one is a class that simply fetches the data that's appropriate for moreover if you call the appropriate methods and the user manager actually stores all of the users for this, data, uh, for this website in an XML file. So because realistically we're not using supporting hundreds or thousands of users, we actually just dump all the user preferences into an XML file, which for small sites, perfectly reasonable. And also it's a nice way of now sort of uh, transitioning us to the server side while still using some of those basic building blocks. So let's take a look now. In our project three directory, you will see that you have a structure very similar to the one I already promised. So build.xml automates the building tasks, which saves you some keystrokes in Java C. The conf directory, again, has that server.xml file. And the spec walks you through this, but you'll have to configure it with your own choice of port numbers. Uh, the source directory has all the source code that we've given you. Web apps directory has the uh, framework for this website. I'll give you a teaser in the web apps directory. Here's a bunch of JSPs, it looks like, uh, a bunch of images, and some XML files in there. But the spec will walk you through a lot of these files. And I'll actually walk us through the spec briefly in just a moment. But let's go ahead and dive right in by choosing a port number. I'm going to choose my own 8081 there, and then port. 8080. I already killed my other web server as of right now. So I'm going to go ahead and first run ant, which notice compiles a whole bunch of classes, all of which were depicted in that diagram a moment ago. Now I'm going to run Tomcat, but this is my base directory. I'm still on ice one. I spawned this on port 8080. So let's pull that up. Let's go to the root of the server, enter, and there we go. So here's the beginnings of my portal. We give you a username and password for free, jharvard, password is crimson, let's log in. There's your view servlet. Fortunately, now you have a, a blank slate here, and this is where your work begins. So let me go ahead now and pull up computer science, nine. let's pull up the project spec, and I'll get you started on your way with project three. And do note, I'll say this for the camera too, so that you don't think you have four extra weeks for this problem set, for this project. So the verse, for those of you who are so excited to start project three and downloaded the spec this weekend, just know I accidentally put project four's deadline on the original PDF. So if you were so ambitious as to download this thing Saturday or Sunday, re-download it. It is due on December 3rd per the syllabus. All right, no excuses for being four weeks late. All right. So let's take a look, and I'll give us our walkthrough of the PDF so that after tonight, you at least have a sense of where you can go next. So let's go ahead and scroll through here. You should have a printout of this tonight. Uh, let's see. So it seemed to be helpful in the past when I explicitly said what problems you should be able to do. So one, two. I'm going to skim over some of the details for now, since it's really meant to be a narrative that walks you through a lot of the code. Three, four. Um, let me make note of four so that you can jot yourself a note. We've not gotten yet to DTD. And as in past projects, when you don't, notice, uh, don't recognize some syntax, unless you've been completely disengaged, probably just means we haven't gotten to it. So even though I think it's very reasonable to read for, because it's sort of a language DTD that you can infer the meaning of, just realize that it will make more sense next week. But this, isn't, this is a zero point question anyway. Um, number five, we introduced the architecture, which I already did visually. So do read that through for narrative's sake as well. It tells you where everything is in the directories. Because more so than the past projects, there's many more files and many more directories, none of which are large. But it's just organized in such a way as to be as consistent as possible with industry standards. We have a source directory, a build directory, a web apps directory. So there's a lot of structure there, even though the app is somewhat small. Uh, number. Six is uh, okay, meant to make you smile. And number seven is where the real work begins. 
So seven essentially prescribes the requirements for the view servlet. So if we, I won't read this verbatim certainly, word for word, but the design choice we made just so that we can tra begin transitioning from project two to project three is to actually generate the view page by way of an XSL file called view.xsl. The idea of which is that your servlet will essentially generate some XML content, relay that to the style sheet so that you can apply some of the lessons we've used in previous projects to actually transform that XML content with the XSL to XHTML content. There are different ways to do this, and by final project time, invariably there are some students who transition to using JSPs more for that, or using servlets and avoiding XSL altogether, but for now, again, we're just tying things together, and you'll be free for your final project to take uh, any approach you wish. But essentially, these um, lowercase Roman numerals specify exactly how this view servlet must behave. You'll find that we put in the preferences file for the JHarvard account already some subscriptions to feeds. Because the catch, of course, would be it's kind of hard to implement the view servlet if John Harvard has no preferences, but you have no preferences servlet with which he can sign up. A little chicken and the egg problem. So we hard coded in some preferences for JHarvard so that you can actually start building the view servlet right out of the box. So that presumably John Harvard, when logged in, should see his favorite news feeds and the top headlines. But problem number eight, which you can also start tackling after tonight, has you uh, start implementing the pref servlet. And frankly, this too, this entire uh, problem, can you also bite off after tonight? What you'll find is that we'll focus on DTD next week. Uh, what else is next week? Uh, X query as well uh, a bit next week. Um, and for the most part, even though that DTD appeared in the narrative, the coding itself makes no assumption about the DTD stuff. So you can certainly forge ahead. And frankly, um, for better or for worse, you can also bite off number nine. Realistically, you won't within the next week, but this is the personal touch, where you'll have become, presumably, by the end of seven and eight, comfortable with the architecture and uh, somewhat savvy, certainly, with servlets, maybe JSPs, more server-side XSL stuff, with which you can now choose some other enhancements to this portal. Maybe it's the stock ticker idea, sports scores, whatever. We pretty much leave it to you and prescribe exactly what we sort of expect for that part. But I would say, in terms of budgeting your time over the next three weeks, because that's pretty much it. Number 10 is just for fun, and number 11 is the submission instructions. A good way to structure this would be to spend one week on the view servlet, one week on the pref servlet, and one week on the personal touch. Uh, I'd be wary of doing all three within one week, because if only it takes away from the fun of the projects, or at least the adds to the stress. But I would certainly think you in a really good place if after tonight you can somehow find time between now and next Monday to at least get the view servlet working. Maybe it's not going to look as pretty as you want, but at least if it's functionally working, you'll be in really good shape for the next uh, n weeks. When is what? Uh, was it a two, uh, Thursday? I think so. Uh, you, t you tell me. The 15th? OK. Oh, yeah, we got it right here. November 15th, so a week and a Thursday. Yep. There's overlap intentionally to give folks discretion as to when to um, allocate their resources, even though you have three weeks at least for each of them. Other questions? No? All right, why don't we officially adjourn here, and I'll stick around if you have one-on-one -on -one questions.